Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service for the second Sunday of Advent. Um, welcome to those who are actually present with us in the building this morning and those who are participating from home. Um, this morning will be a little bit different because we've realised for people in church to be able to hear what is being read or said by people who are um, contributing online has a few technical difficulties. It was okay when it was just three of us in the building because we were all in this area and we could just hear stuff on the computer. So that's presented a few technical challenges which is going to involve a few gaps as we try to move things from one place to another to get things to work. So please bear with us. And Tom, I hope you're listening. If you're listening, can you wave at Julio, please? Yes. Okay. So when we, come to, when we come to the sermon, you'll need to wait a little bit until we switch over from one system to another so people can hear you both at home and in church. Um, and I think other than that, it's just nice to be able to have people in the building as we celebrate communion. When it comes to communion, those of you who are present in church, we'll do what we've been doing in recent months, which will be a tray of double cups um, on that table there. Just come up one at a time, please. Get your cup, go back to your place, and we'll all receive communion together. And at home, you will be listening to the communion um, song at that point. Um, so we're going to start our service in darkness. I'm going to ask Lynn to turn the lights out in the chancel. And we're going to start by um, lighting our second Advent candle. Um, and then we're going to hold silence and we'll have our first hymn. So let us pray. God our Father, you spoke to the prophets of old of a Saviour who would bring peace. You helped them to spread the joyful message of his coming kingdom. Help us as we prepare to celebrate his birth, to share with those around us the good news of your power and love. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world. So we have our first hymn, which is on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. And we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Surely the people are grass. 
the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God which stands forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice for strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lay, lead the mother's sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Second readings from 2 Peter. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, but with the love, Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought you to be leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will set in place and dissolve, and the elements will melt the fire. But in accordance with this promise, we wait for the new heavens and the new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while we are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord for salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
samengevatten. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, Sing, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thank you. Thank you. My friends on Zoom and good morning to everybody else. <laughs> the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We hit the road running with St. Mark's Gospel. We find ourselves in the wilderness of Judea and it's prepare the way of the Lord. A crazy man, drenching people with the water of the Jordan, telling them that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. No nativity stories, no author's prologue, just straight in to meet the Lord's anointed. I had a dream during this week about reading St. Mark's Gospel, and it was a nightmare. I had been tasked with reading the whole of Mark aloud to the participants of some kind of conference or summer school, and they were all patiently waiting while I looked for the book. First off, I came into the lecture hall and opened what turned out to be a racy teenage cartoon paraphrase of St. Mark's Gospel. And amid all the dramatic images scrawled on each page, I couldn't really work out which of the speech bubbles to read first, and it all came out in just one terrible jumble. So I gave up and excused myself and hunted high and low for another proper Bible. I found a handsomely bound volume and went back into the lecture hall, only to find when I opened it that it must have been the Bible that belonged to the Vicar of Dibley as the center was all cut out and in the open space, there was nothing but chocolate bar wrappings. It was a nightmare. Now, I know exactly where this dream came from. I had already decided the day before to invite you today, each and every one of you, to invite you to read St. Mark's Gospel from beginning to end in one sitting. Yes, it has to be in one sitting. Sometime 
in the next 12 months. So you'll find an opportunity for sure. Here's why. Last Sunday, Advent Sunday, we began year two in the three year cycle of Bible readings at Sunday services. And year two is the year of Mark. Mark's gospel is much shorter than Matthew's year one and Luke's year three and much shorter again than John's Gospel, from which we have readings spread across all three years of the cycle. That's how it works. I wonder if you've noticed over the years. We hear quite a bit of John in Mark's year, of course, because Mark is so much shorter, including John's take on John the Baptist, which we'll hear next Sunday. But Mark, Short and direct and racy, gripping like a superhero film. And one could say cataclysmic in the way it hurtles towards the last week in Jerusalem. Passion, crucifixion, empty tomb and flashbang it's all over. Or perhaps the author's intention is it's just begun. So my friends, I invite you any time in the coming months through which we will be hearing portions of Mark's gospel on most Sundays. I invite you to plan your opportunity to find a space and time undisturbed, breathe deeply and go with it. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. From beginning to end in one sitting, but please note, by end, I mean chapter 16 and verse 8, and then shut your Bible for a good while before you take a look at the much later added endings to St. Mark's Gospel. There is a longer ending and a shorter ending printed in all our Bibles. Both of them are part of the canon of Scripture, but clearly neither of them were written as part of the original composition and most mo modern versions of the Bible will tell you that in the notes. So it's chapter 16, verse eight, and let the crash landing of Mark's original ending uh, have its dramatic impact upon you. Perhaps you can tell I'm a fan of Mark. Of course, there are passages in Matthew, Luke and John, which I love dearly and are of sublime and supreme significance to me as to us all. But as a whole volume, for me, it's Mark. So this very early on in the 12 months, we will be hearing it often on Sundays. Let me explore with you the big picture of his gospel and where it's coming from, as it were. Most New Testament scholars suggest that Mark is the first of the four gospels to be written. And there is plenty to suggest that both Matthew and Luke use Mark quite a lot as a primary source of evidence and text for their own work. Many of those scholars propose that the links between the dire predictions of Jesus about the fall of Jerusalem and the coming sufferings of his followers, as we read them in Mark, the links between those passages and events in the late 60s of the first century, suggest that this gospel was, gospel was written in the late 60s. So within 40 years of the death and resurrection of Christ and the birth of the Christian movement. So written for whom, by whom, where, all these questions. And there are no certainties about the answers. But again, New Testament scholars have suggested pretty reasonable answers. The way places in the Holy Land are described in Mark's Gospel suggests that it is written for people who are not familiar with it, who lived elsewhere in the Mediterranean world, 
Likewise, it's clearly written for people not necessarily familiar with Jewish customs. So a largely Gentile audience in mind. Mark, like every other book in the New Testament, is written in Greek, but apparently, I'm just reading what the scholars say here, apparently there are underlying Latinisms, which of course could place it anywhere where the Roman presence was strong around the whole empire. The author, whoever it was, does not reveal himself or herself in the text. But there is no reason to, re, there is no reason to contest that it is largely the work of a fellow called Marcos or Marcus or such. Just some scholars have ta toyed with the idea that perhaps he does reveal himself, though not his name. Listen to Mark chapter 14, verse 51, and we are in Gethsemane, and Jesus has just been arrested. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Who was that? Who knows? So who is Mark? There is a John Mark, or rather a John also called Mark, mentioned twice in the Acts of the Apostles, and one mention is not at all complimentary. Paul and Barnabas apparently had a sharp disagreement over whether or not to include him in their second missionary journey, because apparently Mark had, quotes, deserted them in Pamphylia on the first journey. The other mention is earlier on in the Acts of the Apostles, when following his miraculous escape from prison in Jerusalem, Peter goes to, quote, the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So something is coming together here. Mark is perhaps a not so mature fellow who lives in Jerusalem and is personally involved with Barnabas and Paul and Peter, a young man, a young man right at the center of things, it would seem, in the earliest years of the Christian movement by the sound of it. Right in there where the years following would certainly mature him. There's more. Peter, after his escape from prison, disappears from the scene of the Acts of the Apostles, never to be mentioned again. But of course, years later comes the first letter of Peter, almost certainly written from Rome. The giveaway is in the greeting at the end of that letter. Your sister church in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings. Now, no one imagines that this Babylon was the ancient ruins in Iraq. No, this is code, you see. So this coded Babylon is the current seat of power oppressing the people of God, as the ancient Babylon was during the years of the exile, five centuries before. This letter clearly is written from Rome, seat of the empire controlling the whole Mediterranean region at that time. Now let me read the whole of the greeting at the end of this letter from Rome, and you'll see why it fits for today. Your sister church in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love, Peace to all who are in Christ. So ends Peter's first letter. None of this is certain or provable, of course, but could it be then that Mark's gospel was written in Rome by a man who had lived in Jerusalem, who had for some time been a key member of Peter's ministry team 
in the early years of the church's life in the capital of the Roman Empire. Could it be then that in reading Mark's gospel, we are pretty close to reading Peter's gospel? Mark, who will often have listened to Peter speak of his deeply formative time as a companion of Jesus in his preaching and healing ministry, his journey to Jerusalem and the trauma they all experienced there. Mark, who indeed had often listened to Peter speak self-effacingly of his own failures in understanding and following Jesus, Yes, it is clearly in Mark's gospel where all the failings and none of the successes of Peter are blatantly described. No wonder then that in reading Mark, we feel we are there. The person and the personality of Jesus and his relationship with his friends and followers and all that, he's, all that he does comes through to us, larger than life. Is it Mark, who may or may not have met Jesus, who takes us through the lens, through the lens of Peter's vivid memories of that time, of his stumbling beginnings as a disciple, who brings us face to face with the reality of Jesus, the Christ. See how you feel about it when in due time, I hope, you have a chance to sit down and read the gospel according to Mark from beginning to end, one sitting. Enjoy and let it go deep. Amen. So together, let us affirm the faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified unto Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in our holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In union with Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to the Father.
Shall I start again? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd unmute myself. I, I do apologize. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, at this season of Advent, we seek you and your kingdom. We gather to hear your word and to pray for peace in our hearts, our nation and our homes. Help us to find time for quiet thought and prayer. May our joy be deeper and our lives worthy of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. We pray for the church. Throughout the world, make it a holy church, a praying church, a giving and a serving church. We pray your blessing on our Bishop Christine in all her life and work. Following the Benefice Diary, we ask your blessing on the church in the Falklands and Botswana. In our diocese, we pray for the people of Ashington, Bolam, Heartburn with Meldon, Netherwitten, and Walton. Locally, we pray for the residents of Mount Pleasant. We ask your blessing on the children the staff and parents at Broomley School. We pray for our own country. We pray that you will bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen. We pray for our government, our communities and our families. Unite us all to listen patiently and with goodwill to work to find loving and caring ways to support each other in these difficult times. As our government seeks to make huge decisions on our behalf, guide them to work without bias for a fair and balanced solution for all. God of peace, we pray that those in authority will work for peace and love. Guide the leaders of all nations that justice may prevail throughout the world. Let the needy not be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. May us, your peacemakers in this world, and let your glory shine over all the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the elderly, the housebound and the lonely. We pray your blessing and healing on all who suffer in body and mind or spirit, especially those whose lives are affected by COVID infection. We pray for Margaret Chambers, Margaret Dixon, Jennifer Emmett, Chris Pringle, Gwyneth Matthews and Mike Pannell and all those known to us as we name them now in silence. Strengthen and support them all as they deal with the anxiety that ill health and injury bring. May they find comfort and reassurance from trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died recently, remembering Margaret Ferguson, and for their family and friends, and all who mourn the loss of loved ones, that they may know your comfort and reassurance. We bring to mind on the anniversary of their death, Stan Wright, Garth Darney, John McHarry, Ian Hall, Betty Dainton, 
Ellen Beatty and Sadie Veach. We pray for them and those known to us and no longer with us. We thank you, God, for all the ways in which they have enriched our lives. As we remember them and our own loved ones, may we be guided by their lives to live our lives as examples of your love and care for us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we begin a new week, may your light shine on us, may your love surround us, and may the light of the Spirit shine through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand, please, for the peace? In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And let's offer a sign of peace to one another in whatever way we can. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lord, with you. Lift up your hearts. Will you lift to the Lord? Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ your Son. For when he humbled himself to come among us in human flesh, he fulfilled the plan you formed before the foundation of the world to open for us the way of salvation. Confident that your promise will be fulfilled, we now watch for the day when Christ our Lord will come again in glory. And so we join our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven to proclaim your glory, forever praising you.
Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Good day, I say, Christ is risen, Christ is risen. And so far, the calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world. Rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of St. Peter, St. George, St. John, St. Mark, and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
So together, whether at home or in church, we pray, praying that Jesus would be present with us. We we'll say together, in union with Heavenly Father, with your people throughout the world and across the centuries, gathered to make communion, hearing your holy word and receiving the precious body and blood, we offer you praise and thanksgiving even though we are not now able to taste the bread of heaven and drink the cup of life, we pray that you will unite us with all the baptized and with your Son who gave his life for us. Come, Lord Jesus, dwell in us and send your Holy Spirit that we may be filled with your presence. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep us all in eternal life.
So let us pray. With love and compassion. And the Lord Jesus. With judgment and mercy. And the Lord Jesus. In power and glory. And the Lord Jesus. In wisdom and truth. And the Lord Jesus. So just a few notices before the dismissal gospel, which is really, I suppose, only supposed to be used on the first Sunday of Advent, but I think it's a good thing to remind us each week in Advent what Advent is about, and that invitation to repent and believe in the good news. Um, in terms of notices, just a reminder that if you want to come to church, we are doing services from St John's each week. You do need to let me know you come in. If you don't hear from me, you can assume that there is a place and you can come. Um, this afternoon we have our first at four Christingle service, so that's in Zoom, and I've sent everybody the link, so please, if you can, do come along for that. It won't be terribly long, about maybe half an hour, 35 minutes. And then next Sunday and the Sunday after, so that's Sunday the 13th and Sunday the 20th, Jane and Lynn are going to lead us in a couple of reflective Advent services, also in Zoom. So we'll make sure that the links are sent around this week, and please do come along to those. It's always good to have some time to just be still in Advent and to spend some time reflecting and thinking. Um, and I think that's it really. Um, so I'm going to invite Lynn to come now and and do this, the dismissal gospel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you. Scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And we have our final hymn. And those of you in church who wish to sit down for this thing. Thank you.
as we await our coming Saviour, go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So thank you, everybody.